Okay, so thanks very much for the introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, huge thanks to Digital Futures and, of course, to Ivan and to Kale. And um, oh, let me switch to presentation mode. Okay. Okay. And of course, I have a long name, but he, outside Portugal, I'm just Ron Souza. So <laughs> you're, you're, you're right. So today I'll be talking about maritime robotics and ocean exploration and where are we and where are we going? Of course, this will be a bit biased because I'll be talking about my work, but I also intend to give you sort of an overview of what is going on in other places. And to start with motivation, so in this picture, you see continental Portugal, then you see the Madeira Islands and the Azores Islands, and this white line represents the outer limits of our uh, claim to the extension of the continental shelf. So there's a huge motivation for us to have a sustained presence in the ocean. So here's an outline of my presentation. So I'll start by briefly discussing the ocean challenges. Then I'll go into a man maritime vehicles. Then I'll briefly discuss what, what we are doing in our lab, discuss emerging trends, where are we going in time with some conclusions. And this is the reason why we are here the oceans, who planet, but still this is quite misleading because the naked reality is this. So if you put all the water in the planet, it will fit inside a ball of this size. So this means that, hey, if we were concerned about uh, uh, say oceans, we should be even more concerned because there's not much water in there. And even say worse, because we still don't know much about what is going on there. So according to Walter Monk, the previous century was a century of undersampling. So uh, I got this slide from John Delaney just to basically illustrate the complexity of the ocean and of interacting processes. Uh, of course, I'm not going uh, over the details because we would spend the rest of the presentation here, but I would just like to highlight the fact that these are very complex processes. We, we still don't know much about those. Still an, another important reference uh, to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2021 was awarded for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex physical uh, systems. And basically these two guys, Man, uh, Manabe and Hasselman, uh, got it, especially for physical modeling of Earth's climate quantifying variability in reliability, uh, predicting global warming. So let me briefly go over some of these processes. You're familiar with this one, the global thermal line circulation, the conveyor belt, which has to do with temperature and salinity variations and goes around the globe. Uh, another curiosity, which is also quite relevant to what we are discussing here, the top few meters of the ocean store as much heat as the Earth's entire atmosphere. And of course, you can also count the deep ocean, but still. Another important observation, which has to do with ocean currents, which have to do with dissipation of energy on smaller and smaller scales. So to the left, you see uh, SST, sea surface temperature map. So basically from satellite imagery. And to the right, you see some model uh, outputs in more detail. And you see exactly these like, sort of uh, this feeling of smaller and smaller scales. This is the Gulf Stream. An important thing uh, is the turbulence. And actually it occurs at all scales from the macro, macro, uh, macro uh, turbulence to mesoscale in mesoscale eddies to micro scale. And the important thing, and we'll go back to this again, is transference of properties between scales occurs through turbulent uh, mixing and there's no general theory of turbulence. Another important thing, then again, also has to do with dissipation of energy in the ocean. Internal waves, the idea is very simple. Imagine that you have two masses of water with different densities, and if nothing happens, this will be quite stable. One will sit on the top of the other one. But if there's a perturbation, the perturbation will propagate as a wave along the interface. And this is exactly what happens in Gibraltar Straits. Uh, and this is even more complex because of the bottom, which has a very strange uh, kind of morphology. 
And this is exactly what you have, what you have when you have 20 quarters in the Mediterranean waters. And then there's forcing, tidal forcing. And then you get waves underwater and the wave heights can be in the order of 70 meters. And in some places, for example, like in the South China Sea, they can reach 180 meters. Another important thing, then again, talking about the oceans, microbes are everywhere. Huge numbers. And the interesting thing is that they weigh at least one order of magnitude more than all of humankind. So something to pay attention to. Then the question is what we need to measure. And people came up with the essential ocean variables to be able to deliver ocean forecasts and early warnings, climate projections, and assessment of and protect ocean health and benefits. So you have four types of UVs, essential ocean variables, and then you have lots of different types of UVs. I have not go, I have not gone, gone into details. The same thing with uh, EVVs, essential biodiversity variables. So you have six classes of those, and then for each uh, of these classes, you have several EBVs. Then again, I won't go into details. Another thing is, what about observation? So how do you go about observation? And ships have been the mainstay of ocean observation, but there's one problem. Actually, there are more problems. One is that the ship can only be at one time at, uh, at one place. So, but in spite of the fact, and you still go to NOAA web's page, they say that ships remain the only method for obtaining high quality, uh, high spatial and vertical resolution measurements of several different quantities. Recently, and not say not that recently, people, and there was a seminal paper by Tom Curtin, Jim Bellingham, and the other guys about autonomous oceanographic sampling networks and the idea is to use other assets for uh, sampling. But we can go one step further. And people have been using, uh, have been talking about in talking and doing the integration of animal-borne instruments into global observa observing systems. So you have, you're tagging sharks, you're tagging whales, you're tagging, tagging um, turtles. And to put all of these things in perspective, nothing like looking at observation footprints. In X, you have distance, size, and in Y, you have time. And then what you have there are the observation footprints for some of these assets. For example, for satellites, for small vehicles or so. And definitely in terms of observation, you want to be here in this region. I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah, you can see my pointer. And this means that you cannot do it with one asset. So you have to do it with multiple uh, assets. And then what are the observation challenges? For example, follow a molecule of carbon dioxide from here to here on a scale of hours to months to eventually years. So you need synodic observations on large spatial scales like taking a photograph. You need persistent ob ob uh, observations uh, you have to go from the micro to sub mesoscale and to mesoscale and you need to be able to do other things and the only way to do this is with a man vehicles underwater surface air and space and having coordinated observations of course this is not an easy en en endeavor because the oceans let's say first of all there's no gps communications are a problem you don't have uh, gas stations, so it's very difficult to do it. And then there's another problem, and this is still an open problem, very interesting, but still, which relates to the Nobel Prize in physics, the issue of models sampling in a simulation. So models, they have some unresolved terms and parameterizations to address these. And the question is, how do these capture higher resolution behaviors? Because you can have models at different resolutions. How are these calibrated? And is the resolution adequate? Sampling, as I told you. So this is mainly based on ships. And typically, the way it's being done is ships go on a straight line. Then they stop. There's a rosette. That goes down, takes a kind of a samples, measurements, and then they went for a few other kilometers, do the same thing again and again. 
And in comparison, the men vehicles sample continuously. So there's a huge difference there. And then there's also the issue of data simulation, which is what you do with the data so that you combine data with uh, uh, ocean models to yield best estimates of the state of the ocean. And then again, how do you do this with sparse measurements? What about guiding adaptive sampling? Because you don't have that many. And recently, this paper came out recently about some fundamental limitations to some of these processes. It's about global circulation models, but it's more general. And so basically these are uh, evolving in three dimensional, in three dimensions with unresolved terms represented in equations with tunable parameters. There are some limitations, structural error, the way the equations are put together, and uncertainty across models with different representations of unresolved scales, and the fact that models are tuned to reproduce certain aspects of the observed uh, Earth. And then again, they also talk about the future generation of models that may address uh, issues uh, through substantially higher resolution and detail data simulation and machine learning techniques. Now switching gears, and sorry for going fast, let's talk about the manned maritime vehicles. So most of the vehicles in the market are still automated in the sense that tell them to execute the script and then they will execute the script. Do this and after this, do that, do that and do that. We also have not that many autonomous vehicles in which the sense to deliberate uh, and act cycle is intrinsic, which means that you have deliberation on board. We have lots of different types of underwater vehicles, starting with uh, AUVs. Most of you are familiar with that, with submersibles. Uh, just one observation, up to 2019, most people have been to the moon then to the bottom of the ocean. This was no longer true starting in 2020. Then you have tow fishes and uh, ROVs. Tow fishes are basically towed by ships. You also have gliders, and we are talking about ocean observation and robots. Uh, the idea is very simple. They don't have propellers, although some of them may have propellers. Uh, so they adjust buoyancy. So if buoyancy decreases, those guys will sink. If it increases, those guys will come to the surface. Then you also have moving masses to basically change the center of gravity, so to help those guys pitch down or pitch up. And then you have these wings that allow these guys to glide, and so they, they kind of go like this in yo-yo patterns. Uh, docking stations, another important component for sustainable presence in the ocean. These are basically underwater garages for recharging and for data exchange. Then you have some very interesting energy harvesting vehicles, for example, like the wave glider, two bodies, and a cable. So because of waves, the cable pulls the, the, the bot, uh, let's say, the bottom the body, and this body converts vertical motion into horizontal motion. And that's why these guys can cross the Atlantic or Pacific. There's an European version of this, which is called the Aquanaut. We have one, and only has one body. Other interesting developments, underwater vision profiler, which is a sort of a, basically a camera that takes images of plankton and also other particles down to 6,000 meters. And during a regular deployment, you get to image approximately six uh, cubic meters of water. Argos floats, and again, you have thousands of them in the oceans. And so they have antennas for communications. They also have a buoyancy engine, lots of sensors. And this is a typical mission profile. So they are deployed from a ship. Then they descend to drifting depth. They keep drifting for something like 10 days. Then they descend to profiling depth. They come to the surface, broadcast the data, and then start the cycle again. And you can see all of these all over the yeah. The, the oceans. One important observation when it comes to multi-vehicle operations, so you buy one vehicle from this vendor, you buy another vehicle from this vendor, and typically the control stations don't talk to different vehicles, so this is a current limitation. It's not a technical one, but it's there. Some trends in terms of communications, uh, I would like to highlight uh, underwater optical communications, 
interoperability, there are still, we are still lacking interoperability standards for docking. People are working on interoperability standards for multiple assets in terms of computational systems. People are talking about cloud computing, are talking about edge computing, software, AI, machine learning, big data, now a big thing. And in terms of sensors, people are now working on nutrients, uh, the idea of a lab on a ship, eDNA sampling, uh, holographic and microscopic cameras, drifting, drift cams, which are basically drifters that are released from the surface. They go, go down and they'll stay very close to the bottom of the ocean and then they'll drift and take both photographs and then again, energy storage and all this thing. Now, let me talk a little bit about what we do there. So we've been designing, building and deploying UXVs for applications in the ocean sciences, security and defense. And we're also developing the software tool chain that powers all of these guys. And this is our vision for a sustained presence in the ocean. Lots of different assets, as you can guess. Also different types of interactions. I won't bother you with these. There's also visual scalability. Okay, now we know how to operate, let's say, several assets. What, what about 100? What about 1,000? Still an open question. We have been using vehicles as data mules with support for disruptive torrent networking. And uh, we also have what people in computer science call physical mobile locality, which is basically vehicles delivering other vehicles. But in our vision, we want to treat this ensemble or to control this ensemble as a system that has properties that are a function of the vehicles, communication networks, and interactions that you establish over these. So you can have system level commands. This is not PowerPoint engineering, so we've been developing the tools and technologies that will enable us to achieve these goals. So these are some of our toys, not all of them are here. These were supposed to be low cost in modular. Sometimes the notion of low cost is quite fuzzy. Some of them are long endurance. Some of our AUVs can do over 60 hours of operations. We also have an autonaut and we have some exotic machines. These guys are interoperable, meaning that they can talk to each other. And now you see here the operation of, of some of them. So AUV deployments, you just need to make sure that there's water there. It happened before <laughs> that people were not careful enough. <laughs> then different types of, uh, so ASVs and now different types of UAVs, kind of a flying wing and there, uh, what we call our flying modem. So take off and landing from water. And then another important piece of what we are doing is our software tool chain. So we have Dune running on board. We have IMC, which is our protocol for communications. Then we have Naptus that runs on your laptop and lets you interact with all of these assets. And then we have Ripple, which is the web expression of that. Uh, we also have AI planners on board. So we have T-Rex, you can send high level objectives and then it's up to T-Rex to decide when and how those will be executed. And then off board we have Eruptus that basically sends high level objectives to different vehicles for coordinated operations. Ripples is our web enabled control center and we also have support for interoperability frameworks. Without going into lots of details, this is very important and we are evolving this tool Ripples, it's a web-based C4I system, supports multiple maps, multi-vehicle planning and execution control, interoperability, multi-domain communications, user control access and authorization, support for C2 hierarchies, and ingestion of data from multiple sources. We have configurable alerts, multiple visualization layers, and modularity to facilitate integration of new algorithms. So these are some of the visualization layers. So we ingest data from remote sensing, from model outputs. We have programmable mm -hmm. alerts, and we also have chat support. For example, with chat support last year during the Red and US exercise, we were able from our computer to talk with the submerged man submarine. Operations. So we've been operating in lots of different places. We have been organizing large scale exercises. We have deployments from shore ships and man submarines. And uh, this is just one example, more examples, but this one is somewhat special to us. It's this RAP MUS exercise, which is co-organized in cooperation with the Portuguese Navy, 
NATO CMRE, NATO MUS initiative, and more recently with EDA. This is a large scale experimentation exercise, which is basically developed in the framework of the triple helix involving academia, industry, and armed forces. Keep in mind that this is not a military exercise. And then we have several focus areas and some nice assets. Uh, this is very important because the exercise has been grown in scope and just from 2021 to 2022, just in terms of uh, underwater vehicles, in 21 we had 29 and 22 we had approximately 60. Now imagine the operation of 60 AUVs in the same area. And of course, now there's a concern for interconnectivity to interchangeability in the sense that you also want to hand over the control of some of these assets. And we've been doing this with Ripple support. Some examples of what we've done, I'll go succinctly over these. Optimal trajectory in the presence of currents. Now imagine that, so this is an estuary, then this is the ocean. Imagine that you want to reach this uh, red point. I don't know if you, if you can see it there. It's there. And then you have tidal currents, which are quite strong. And so the matching principle does not apply periodically. Then we came up with the value function approach. And what you see here is a time slice of the value function. And the meaning of this is quite simple. So if you look at one of these lines, it means that for the specific time, time slice, you can depart from any one of these points and if you follow an optimal trajectory, you'll get to destination at exactly the prescribed arrival time. The value function depends on position and time. So if you fix a position and then you might or you minimize with respect to time, then you can come up with a very nice partition of the area, which tells you, for example, in this case, that if you depart from this region, you'll get to the destination much faster. This was, this was not only about simulations. We did it on, with a real vehicle, uh, 13 kilometers, velocity gain 28%, and the difference between estimated time of arrival and real time of arrival was just two minutes. I think that we were lucky. I think it's just too good to be true. Something else that we did, uh, and then again, this goes into the interoperability and interchangeability is so to the right of this point here, you have several our assets that will talk to Naptas and then to Ripples using internet or setcoms. Then we had Ripples on the command center. And then we were ingesting data from lots of other uh, assets uh, using Cattle, this interoperability framework. And so basically we were ingesting data from tens of different assets. And this was also supported to, by the idea of having control units that would take care of the operation of some vehicles, several control units running in parallel. And then on top of that, you would have a commander. Just a brief reference to these SOI groups that took place in the Pacific a while back, 20, 2018, huge team. And basically, we want to start to study the Northern Pacific Subtropical Front, approximately 1,000 nautical miles west of San Diego. We deployed from the Falcor. And this is a very interesting front because it's very strong in signature and very weak in uh, temperature. And it's a sharp boundary where cold, fresh waters from the north meet warm, salty waters from the south. What you see here are ship tracks from previous surveys. This was the architecture of the system that we deployed. So we are operating from the Falcor. We deployed AUVs and UAVs from the Falcor. And we also had sail drones and wave barbers in the area. We were communicating with these using mainly Iridium. And then data was being sent, data and commands were being sent to Ripples and also received from Ripples. Uh, and Ripples was supporting two control centers, one residing on board the Falcor and another one residing in Porto. So we had four shifts per day and we were operating basically two days nonstop. Two days now, sorry, two weeks. 
And this is a sort of a brief video about the, this deployment. During this expedition, the farm team has created a system to conduct oceanographic surveys with unprecedented levels of detail and scale. Approximately 1,000 miles off the coast of Southern California, we are studying the subtropical front. Here, the two masses of water collide, which generate a unique mix of physical, chemical, and biological features. Before the expedition, autonomous vessels helped us determine the approximate location of the front. When we arrived here, we deployed CTDs to gain a more precise understanding of its spatial dynamics. Our autonomous underwater vehicles, which were specifically designed for this expedition, can cover hundreds of kilometers and stay in the water for up to 50 hours. They travel in a yo-yo pattern, sending real-time data back to the ship every time they surface. Our fixed-wing vertical takeoff UAVs can fly faster and further than quadcopters and carry a variety of sensors. The data our autonomous vehicles collect helps us locate biological hotspots where we conduct more detailed sampling. We are deploying very advanced technology that needs to be refined through experimentation. Okay, so the first problem, how to find the front. Uh, this is mostly quality in the area. So we got, let's say, satellite data was not that useful. So we had these vehicles in the water ahead of the ship's arrival. And then we were looking, we we're trying to find the signature of the front because the front is well known for having a very nice kind of signature in terms of temperature and salinity. And this is exactly what we did. Now, uh, kind of an important observation which goes, goes back to some of the questions I discussed before. So we selected this point. So before the getting to the area, we selected this point to start the exploration of the front. So we put AUVs in the water and what you see here are AUV tracks color coded by salinity. And then we thought, hey, we found the front because you can see this sharp boundary here. But while we were doing this, and this is also very important, we went with the Falkor in south. And then we went from blue, cold water, warm water, cold water, and warm water again. Keep in mind that at the time, this was the only information that we had. So we thought, hey, we really don't understand what's going on, so we'd better perform a sort of a mesoscale mapping in the precedented uh, sub-mesoscale resolution. So having vehicles sampling that for approximately one week. Later on, we figured out what was going on, and this was the only SSD data that we got during this period. So here you can see the front, and there was this filament detaching from the front, and this is exactly what we initially saw. So you see here the difference between if you only had one ship, you thought, hey, you found the front, and then again, by having a ship and AUVs and covering the whole area, you really understood well what was going on. So we did lots of interesting things. So we had automated front detection and tracking. We also had high resolution coordinated sampling. So we had the ship, AUVs and UAVs flying information or moving information to understand what was going on in a given area. And then in terms of data, remote sensing data and in situ data, what we see in the background is a product derived from altimetry, satellite product, uh, which is based on we up north, um, finite size exponents, uh, so finite size of not exponents, sorry, that gives you the skeleton of the currents. And then on the top of that, you see some measurements. These arrows represent the measurements of currents. And so this is consistent with what we observed because we measured currents of up to two knots in the middle of the Pacific. Same thing with SSD data. So we take all these different systems that go beyond the footprint of what a ship can do. They can be 20 miles this way, 20 miles that way, and help us understand the oceans a lot better than we do now. And now a few reference to a few projects. I'll go quite fast over this. So we got funded to start the Center for Atlantic Operations, basically supposed to work 24-7 and support operations in the Atlantic. 
we have in addition to our assets, we'll be buying more assets for long endurance operations. Another project has to do with ecosystem mapping. This is from a, a Horizon project. Uh, basically, the op area is this one here. There's a natural uh, reserve here. And we'll be mapping the UVs. Uh, with ROVs, we go after hotspots. With UAVs, we go for shallow water mapping with hyperspectral cameras and IR cameras. And then we'll perform ecosystem classification using machine learning, which is what you see to the right. And that's a UNIS level three classification. Another project in which we will be addressing exactly the observe, simulate, predict, and sample loop uh, with all of these assets will take place in Nazare Canyon in October. And uh, there to the right, you see what we'll be doing. So we'll have models, we'll be doing a simulation, and to the left, you'll see vehicles that we'll have. So we are using machine learning to predict ocean conditions. So if you will get, for example, data from CMEMS, and this is the entire year of uh, uh, 2018 sea surface temperature, then doing machine, machine learning on that and get mean input predictions and then compare that with reality. And then we'll be using the Harvard uh, Ocean Prediction System. Data collected by all of these assets will be uh, simulated periodically. Then we'll come up with measures of uncertainty and temporal variability. And then we'll cluster these points of interest to define the areas to sample. And then we'll solve a multi-depot, multi-vehicle TSP problem to visit all of these points within the simulation period. Another project, simple idea. So we have an autonaut going from continental Portugal to the Azores Islands. And along the way, we want to basically maximize the science return. So we want to observe eddies, internal waves, fronts. And so we are using machine learning to predict areas of interest, for example, fronts. Now some emerging trends. So this is so-called age of exponentials, according to Ray Kurzweil, and it's not completely wrong, uh, especially if you look at market trends. But if you look at Martex law, then there is a challenge here which basically states that technology changes exponentially, some of it, but organizations change logarithmically. So how do you bridge this gap? This may mean that you have to reset or restart your organization every now and then. Just some trends, for example, Ocean's Infinity, they are uh, deploying large amount ships that will be able to deploy multiple assets. And another trend, and there will be a meeting, a NATO meeting, this is a NATO initiative uh, in Brussels, April 16th, about this idea of the digital ocean. From seabed to the ocean surface to space across millions of miles. It includes unmanned surface vessels, subsea sensors, satellites, ships, buoys, and drones. It builds on the assets we already have and creates an interconnected mesh of immediate data and communication fused together with AI algorithms, computer vision, and acoustic analysis technologies powered by machine learning, all coming together to create a multinational advanced ocean management platform, the digital ocean. So then again, when vision for the future, this is supported by NATO. And now the question is, where are we going? Of course, this may be a bit biased because I will be talking about our perspectives. But then again, you can guess. We'll be talking about systems of systems enabling synotic and sustainable presence in the ocean, incapable of adaptation to sampling requirements. You know, of course, we're talking about system level properties that are a function of the assets, going back to previous slide, communications and uh, interactions. First, a very simple observation. So you can get a vehicle system and typically you can get several subsystems, for example, mm -hmm. platform, payload, mechanical interfaces, command, uh, communication and control, and software and computation. Then you can have several technical features. Now imagine that you buy different vehicles from different vendors, okay? An AUV, an ASV, a UAV, a hybrid vehicle, whatever. But then 
if you're not careful, if these guys are not able to communicate among them, or even if these guys are able to communicate among them, they don't, they don't use any sort of interoperability framework, there's not much you can do with them, okay? And most of the COTS vehicles were not designed for interactions or integration in a team. Now, if you are lucky enough and you buy or develop vehicles that are designed for interactions in terms of communications, in terms of interoperability, and in terms of cooperation skills, so having primitives for cooperation, then you can think about controlling these vehicles as a team, and then you'll get some team level capabilities that were not there before. So you can deliver team level capabilities. And then you can start thinking a bit, you can start to be a bit ambitious. So you can think about deployments in which you have several control centers, you'll have the different teams operating in, in the area, Different teams may use different control strategies. For example, they can use leader forward strategies. They can have a sort of a more decentralized way of kind of uh, organizing themselves. Then teams can exchange assets, for example, between these two teams here for load balancing, if you will. Teams can also open up or close. Uh, this is. This is what's represented by this dashed line, which is the possibility of interacting with external assets. So lots of different ways of having these guys operating, interacting, and changing the topology and the capabilities that these deliver. Of course, we are not there yet, but then again, and going back to what we've been doing before, we are trying to proceed one step at a time. Few observations. First of all, and typically we don't talk much about these in controls. These are cyber physical systems in which you have physical entities, robots, and computational entities programs that will evolve and interact enabled by mobile computation, which has to do with virtual mobility, mobile software, and mobile computing, which has to do with physical mobility, mobile hardware. So these topics have been handled in computer science for a long time, starting with the pioneering work of Robin Milner during a war. And now let's look at this example. Imagine that you have two vehicles that are communicating in some way. Then you have sensors, communication, motion, whatever, motion the, the control units, whatever. And then you have some computational environments and then you have, let's call these processes. And processes can migrate from one vehicle to another one. You can compose processes and you can also block communications with external assets. And if you run adequate controllers, you can form a team. But these are exactly some of the things that have been discussed in computer science for a long time. For example, Luca Cardelli from Microsoft Research was talking about mobile ambience. And you have ambience inside ambience and ambience moving from one ambient to another one. But then again, there was no underlying physics was just in the space of computer uh, systems. And Robin Milner has also been talking about this issue of mobile locality uh, with this idea, for example, of bigraphs. But then again, they missed a few interesting points that we are sort of highlighting here. Then you also need, need some organizing principles. And so we got some, let's say, inspiration from the work of the late Pravin Varaya. Uh, it's not that cited this paper, but it's very interesting. So it basically claims that control of large scale systems is always organized in distributed IoT, which is somewhat true. So there are, let's say, two approaches one using world, one world semantics, and the other using what he called multi world semantics, in which you have separate interpretations at each level. And then he proposes some principles aimed at establishing a scientific framework for analysis and design. The principle of self-containment, in which each layer embodies theories that make it possible to discuss design and implementation of a layer in isolation, taking care of the interfaces, the principle of coherence, and the other principles. This is still valid. And then again, there's a very interesting connection to what we were discussing before in, in the sense of models that 
the oceanographic models or so you have several different resolutions and then the question is how can you be consistent uh, uh, across these resolutions in another important piece of what we are planning to do uh, we've been using dynamic programming to solve interesting problems uh, this was miguel Zegar uh, master thesis and this is just one example of a very tough problem so imagine a minimal time delivery problem for multiple AUVs. So in these AUVs, you need to reach some pre-assigned targets, T1, T2, whatever. Due to energy constraints, each AUV is deployed from a faster carrying, uh, carrier vessel. The vessel itself is not allowed to enter some areas. And then we have disturbances coming from currents. And the problem is how do we plan the deployment positions and times of the AUVs in order to minimize the total mission time. And the total mission time or the low mission time, so you get it by minimizing the duration of the mission time or the duration for each uh, for the missions of each AUV. And then the approach is, so use dynamic programming, but in a very kind of interesting way, which involves concatenating uh, value functions while satisfying the dynamic programming principle. So this is another piece of the puzzle to address what we are proposing to do. Some conclusions, of course, it's tough to make pre predictions, especially about the future. Uh, although, as some people say, for some countries, the past is also unpredictable. So some trends, the pace of change is accelerating. No robot is an island, so we need new models of cooperation networking, and then the power of networking. That's also one of the reasons why, I, why I'm here, and I believe it's also one of the reasons why digital futures exists. And this is pretty much what I had to say, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, um, you had internet on the, these architectural slides that you, you show there. So could you say a little bit about uh, security and is it really connected on internet or you? Uh... That's that's a very good question. And so we had interaction the internet in some of the, the operations there, not in all of them. And for example, for the Rep MUS exercise, so the guys from the Portuguese Navy and NATO were taking care of, uh, let's say, security. And we also had a kind of a sort of a private networks to account for that. It's not a solved problem yet, but for us, it's also very important. So last year, we also had the MS MSC thesis exactly uh, handling these, these problems. Do, do you think that, so to say, the what is out there with protocols and so on is... To, to guarantee security and cyber no. is enough, or you see this some opportunities for, so to say, that you locally actually make some guarantees that what you're executing on one of your vessels actually come from the, the, the true source and things like. like yeah, uh, I, uh, as I told you, so I don't believe that the solutions that we have right now are uh, perfect. And I believe that there's lots of scope for 